Oh hi everyone, in this video I will be explaining how I did this horse portrait. There are also a few things to consider and bear in mind when you are drawing horses which I'll also explain in this video. Now just like with all the portraits, I typically once I've done the background will then start working on the eye. Now horse eyes are very different to cats and dogs, they are more rounded in shape and they also have a lot of the wrinkles and creases around the eye so it's really important to get these in place. The trick to that is making sure that your shadows and your highlights are in the correct place but also that they are bright enough and dark enough so that your contrast is as it should be. If you do not have your contrasts you know, as hyped up as they should, the portrait's going to be more flat. So really make sure you get those darks as dark as they need and your whites as bright as they need to be. The process for putting down your base layers for horses, I do slightly differently. You're really wanting, when you are creating a summer coat, which this horse here has it's very short and sometimes in certain areas you don't even see the fur direction it's more of a sheen so what I tend to do is use the side of the pencils to get a really nice coverage and therefore it can help to create a really nice soft blended base layer which is what you can see here now for this portrait you'll notice that I've used only my pastel pencils throughout the entire portrait the only part where I've used soft pastel sticks was for the background my method for putting down my base layers will vary from portrait to portrait and the reason why I stuck to my pastel pencils for this portrait was because this horse had a really unique colouring and there was quite a lot of subtle differences between the lights and the darks. I wanted to be as accurate as I could for this because of the colour of this horse. There was a lot of Caput Mortem's magenta type colours and I was a bit concerned that if I used my pan pastels or my soft pastel sticks that I sand down on some sandpaper and then I ap apply those to my pastel mat with my soft tools. I was a little bit concerned that I would be putting too much colour in too much of a larger area. So that's why for this portrait I decided to use my pastel pencils. Now this clip here is of a, a screenshot type video that I uploaded for Patreon. This just over one hour video on Patreon I go through various reference photos to explain how I choose those base layers depending on the subject that I'm looking at. I speak through why I pick that colour, how I would layer that colour and the order that I would be putting them down because this was a video that was requested by quite a few Patreon members because selecting your initial base layer colour can be really quite tricky especially when I found you know working on this horse portrait when you've got something that is a unique colour, it doesn't always make sense to which colour you should be layering down first. So in this video, I talk about eyedropper tools and how you can use your various colours to get the initial outcome that you're after. So if that is of interest, that is also available over on Patreon. As I say, it's just over one hour and I have selected various photos, dogs, cats and horses of all different fur types, different textures and different colours so that I can try and cover as much um, as variety as I can. And also on my Patreon page I also do polls regularly so that my members can select which reference photo they would like me to do a study of. It, this photo that you can see on the left corner here is um, the, the drawing that I did of this same reference photo in the video here. So I have allowed my Patreon members to try and select which content they would like me to upload based on you know whether or not that poll got the most votes on that fur type. I know then that that is something that my members may be potentially struggling with or something that they find quite challenging. So I try and tailor as much as of the content there as I possibly can. If colour is something that you do struggle with and you find quite challenging, especially when you're putting down your base layers, I really would recommend in downloading an eyedropper tool. You can download them for free on your tablet, your phone, anything like that. And they are a really handy tool. Now, the only thing that I would say and the biggest tip for that is if you are using an eyedropper tool, of course, it does help you to pinpoint the colour and where on the colour wheel that is. So the most important thing is realising whether or not it is a warm colour or a cold colour. So does that colour that you're after, you know, even if it's a purple, on that colour wheel when you've selected that colour with your eyedropper tool, does that look like it's more of a bluer tone? If it is, then that's, you know, you've got to pick up a purple with a slightly more of a bluer tint to it. And the other way around, you know, if it looks like it's got a bit more of a redder purple, you then know to pick up one of those in your set. So they can be really useful. Now the biggest tip that I can give you if you are using an eyedropper tool for your base layer stages, remember that the if you're selecting a colour that's on the very top that's closest to the viewer, that is your value that you need to be putting down last. If you 
that color that you've selected with your eyedropper tool if you put that down as a base layer you're not going to have any more values to put on top because you've selected the color that's at the very surface so you want to be looking to select maybe the shadow next to it because all fur will overlap and create a shadow or you know selecting a slightly darker tone of the one that you have selected so that's the biggest thing that I would recommend because as I say if you are selecting the values that are on the very top your portrait is going to be potentially quite a lot lighter than it should be and therefore you won't have the same degree of contrast if you would like to see this horse portrait in much slower clips some real-time footage as well the just over four hour version is available on my patreon which as i mentioned earlier is linked in my description below if patreon is of interest to you and you've got any questions then please don't hesitate to email me my details are all in the description below so there are a couple of things to bear in mind when you're drawing the ears of any horse is that most of the time the center of the ear is quite dark so you really want to make sure that you get your values as dark as you possibly can in order for those tinier hairs to overlap and show up now a focus study that i've got coming up on patreon is going to be of a horse's mane and the forelock like what i'm working on here that is something that is going to be coming up but basically like with most most of the cases when you're using pastels you want to start from dark to light once you've got your darker layers down you can then overlap a lighter value on top one of the most common questions that i'm asked is why aren't my details showing up now there are a few reasons for that but the most common reason is that the base layers are too light so what you need to do, rather than go and pick a lighter pencil so that those details show up, which ultimately you're going to end up with a brighter portrait, which is potentially not the look you're going for, it just means that your base layers need to be dark enough. So blend out that detail that you started, either with a pencil that you've used previously, or just soften that out with your finger, darken up those base layers, and then reapply those details, and then that should resolve your problem. It's really quite common for the base layers to not be dark enough. I think quite often we're too worried about going too dark in case we make a mistake and we can't brighten it. The really good thing with working with pastels on pastel map is it is really forgiving. There, I speak about it a lot in my Patreon videos because so many times we are we hold ourselves back because we're frightened of making a mistake. The problem with that is is we'll never learn. There are so many times where I'll pick up a pencil and it's not the right shade, it's not the right colour, but because we can soften out these pastel layers and you can layer endlessly on pastel mat, as long as you don't fill the tooth of that paper early on, there really isn't a mistake that you can't fix. Unless you put, you know, you spill something on it or you put a hole through your paper, within reason, anything can be fixed. So during the Patreon tutorials, I try and list each pencil that I'm using but you can just see here how many different colours that I am using. Now that being said, once I found the combination of the colours that worked and how to layer them, it became the process became much quicker. This portrait took me much longer than other horse portraits due to the, 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 you know, the complexity of the colour. I wanted to make sure that I layered my pencils correctly and once I was confident with which pencils to use and the order to layer them, it became much faster. Now, something to bear in mind, pastels are very much like painting. They go very hand in hand. I am in the process of setting up an acrylic tier for Patreon. I think pastels and, and acrylics, because there are many techniques that you can use that sort of can be used between both mediums. So you can almost glaze with pastels similar to acrylics as well. But when you're working with light hand and, and you know light pressure with your pastel pencils, it picks up some pigment from the previous layer and it almost starts to blend together to create that unique colour that you're after. If you watch this, you know, although it is significantly sped up this video, you can still see how many colours go into each small section. And that's another big tip that I would say is if you're working on a horse portrait, quite often because they do have you know that very short fur when they do have a summer coat like this there is those areas where because they don't have they have quite thin skin so it shows all the the skeletal structure and the muscles underneath the skin so it has quite a lot of different shapes shadows like this cheekbone that I was working on there it's very very dark and at that time when you're working on it it may not make sense and it looks like you've made a mistake the biggest thing that I would recommend is just carry on with it because once you get the areas around it complete it all starts to make more sense the other thing that I would recommend is when you are drawing horses 
try and use some reference points so look at your when you're doing your initial outline put in where the cheekbone is put in where there is a specific shadow so that you know that when you look back at your reference photo you can clearly see exactly where you are the reason why that's quite i mean that's important with anything that you're drawing you want to make sure you get your proportions and, and you know the perspective correct but with horses because they do have these um, structures under the skin if you get these in the wrong place, the cheekbone, for instance, too slightly angled down, you know, or too far up to the top, left or right, anything like that, it's going to change what that horse looks like. And ultimately, you don't want to have that, that animal looking, you know, a little bit deformed or just not like that, how it should be. We want to be getting this as close to the photo as we can. So make sure that you get your initial outline correct. A big tip, if you want to enhance your freehand skills, trace it's one of the so many people think that it's cheating but it's a really valuable tool i'm not saying to trace everything but if you if you draw something freehand and you keep on drawing it wrong your brain isn't gonna learn that mistake what i would recommend is trace that photo eight nine ten times however many times you want to do it that once you feel confident then for the final time try freehanding it because you've already drawn it so many times correctly because you've traced it and you know it's right when you then go to freehand it your brain it, it's going to look better than the first freehanded attempt prior to tracing so tracing definitely has its place it's a really valuable tool for enhancing your freehanding skills and obviously we all need to know how to, to freehand it's very very important I do a bit of both. I do. I use transfer paper, especially for my acrylic paintings, but I will always freehand my outline on a separate bit of paper first. I won't draw it directly onto my canvas and I won't draw it like on this on the pastel mat. It's too expensive to be erasing and having lines in the wrong place. So I always freehand on a separate bit of paper. I use transfer paper underneath once I know I've got my sketch correct. And then I know that whatever I'm working on is as accurate as I possibly can get it. So like what I mentioned with the horse's eye, when you start working on the nose and the muzzle area, the biggest tip and the biggest thing to remember is your values, your lights and your darks. Also looking at the colour, you need to make sure that your, you know, is it a cool colour or a warm colour? Going back to what I mentioned earlier and the colour wheel. Have, if it's got more of like a warm greys, which this nose definitely has, make sure you're selecting your values on that warmer scale. So you want greys that have got a bit more of a browner tone to it or a bit more of a creamer tone to it. Now, something to bear in mind when you are doing horse noses and the lip area, really zoom in on your reference photo to make sure you're getting these creases in the lips correct. They are it depends on the size of your portrait you're only going to be able to hint at these but like what i've just done there with this light gray still make sure that you indicate that that's what that is horse mouths are very very soft so these creases are going to indicate at that texture now it's not texture that you can touch because obviously this is very smooth if you were to run your finger across the portrait it's just that visual texture these subtle details will make all the difference and you will notice by the nose here that it looks realistic because my lights and my darks are as strong as they need to be. The inside of the nostril is the, one of the darkest parts of the portrait. And then I've got that nice rolled over highlight to give that illusion of that curved nostril, which is really important. That is the, the lighting is what's going to make this appear that much more realistic. So once I've got the portrait about 80% complete, I will zoom out of my reference photo, similarly to what I've done here with my camera, so that I can see more of that reference photo. This is where I then start to refine my shadows and my highlights and making sure that I've got everything in its correct place, adding some subtle details where needed and just tweaking things to make my portrait that much more realistic. A really good tip is if you think that you're finished with your portrait, put it to the side for a day or two and then relook at it with fresh eyes. When we spend most of the time, I spend days on one portrait, sometimes up to a couple of weeks, depending on the size, you can start to get a bit where you don't notice things. So I always do put my portraits away, tuck them in a drawer, bit of glassine over the top so I know they can't be um, damaged in any way. I know they're safe, but what it will enable me to do is then get it back out in another couple of days, look at it with fresh eyes so that I know I don't then need to, to tweak anything else. I can make those changes photograph it and send it to my client wait for them to, to let me know whether or not they're happy and then I know that you know I am 100% content that I've done as best as I can on that portrait 
before this video here and the one on Patreon, I decided to focus on the mare in the middle. As you can see from the finished portrait in the corner there, there was the foal, which was her foal. So originally this was just going to be uh, an A4 size, so half the size of the portrait that it currently is here, just focusing on the mare. But my client emailed me asking whether or not I could double the size of the portrait and incorporate her foal into it as well. So that's why we went ahead and did this layout. But for these videos, I decided to focus on the mare as you know, she was the main focus of the portrait and she was a unique colouring. So I wanted to make sure I could really do a tutorial that was really focused on getting these shapes, colours and values correct. So here is the finished portrait. As I say, I do have the just over four hour version of this video on Patreon. Also being uploaded in May is how I did this background of this exact portrait. I started off with the brown pastel mat for this and I use my soft pastel sticks to do the background and I do get quite a lot of questions asking how I create this glow, this really soft transition effect. So that is a video that I'm going to be uploading in May so that I can show you all in real time exactly how I did that background. So I hope this video was of use. Do let me know in the comments below and it really does help if you give the video a thumbs up if it was useful. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button if you'd like to get notified of future content and I will be uploading another video very soon.